Revelation chapter uh, 17 and in verse 7, uh, the mystery of the beast. And we looked last week uh, at the, uh, the woman that was riding the beast and uh, in those first six verses. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting chapter. It, um, uh, as we looked at last week, we talked about the fact that she, uh, the woman, described also as a harlot, uh, ends up being the, uh, basically the, the last worldwide religious system that uh, traces its roots and its ancestry all the way back to ancient Babylon, to Genesis 10 and the building of the Tower of Babel, which again was by a man named Nimrod who created the first new world order uh, under which he rebelled against God, sought to draw the people uh, of the world against God in the rebellion against him, uh, builds a tower, uh, basically has a worship uh, area uh, on, the, on the first floor, uh, as well as the top of it, uh, and they were going to uh, basically live exactly the opposite of what God had asked them to do. God confuses their language so they can't continue, uh, and, uh, and, those, and we have the various people groups spread out around the world as a result from that. From that religious center came, uh, in essence, uh, many things that spread to all the other world religious, religions that we have uh, around the world today. Uh, and notably, the worship of the mother and the child, the queen of heaven. Uh, what happens in terms of Christianity uh, is that uh, then with uh, Constantine, 313 AD, the Edict of Milan declaring tolerance now for religion, no more persecution. Within a very short period of time, Rome becomes the headquarters of the, of the New Testament church. Which, uh, and we went to more detail last week, which at that point, the headquarters of Mystery Babylon religion had gone from there. With the downfall of Babylon, it moved to Pergama. That's why Jesus says uh, what he does to the church there, that that is the throne of Satan, where Satan dwells. Uh, that then moves, and those priests move to Rome. Rome is the center of the Mystery Babylon Babylonian religion, it becomes the center of New Testament Christianity with the formation of Roman Catholicism. So again, mystery Babylon religion spreads to other world religions, uh, and then unfortunately, uh, through Roman Catholicism, uh, they become the pipeline so that the mystery Babylon religion can actually come right into Christianity, to the Reformed churches, to other Protestant denominations, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, we talked about the fact that uh, we're not saying that Roman Catholicism is this last world religion. Uh, we are saying that uh, Mystery Babylon is, and it was through them that much of the teaching continued to infiltrate so that in the end, uh, it will all be able to uh, come together. And, uh, and we spent a bunch of time going to some, some details about that. Now, we ended with the fact that John, when he gets all of this information that's being spelled out to him in an image of a woman riding a beast, is that he is, in a sense, shocked and amazed. Why is he shocked and amazed? Because he's being persecuted, and he's living on the Isle of Patmos, and he's watching the persecution under the Roman Empire. And now he's finding out that in the very end, there's going to be a world religious system that includes some segment of Christianity who ends up being the persecutors of God's people. And he's uh, certainly shocked and, uh, uh, and amazed by that. So let's take a look and uh, kind of spell the chapter out in, uh, in the four areas. There's a description of the kingdom that the woman rides on in the verse 7 and 8. We'll look at the duration of the world kingdoms as they are revealed in verses 9 to 13. The downfall of the last 10 kings will be the war with the Lamb in verse 14, and then 15 to 18, the last 10 kings will destroy the false uh, religious system. So let's look at verse 7 and 8, description of the kingdom that the woman rides on. So the woman is the false religious system. She is sitting or riding or for a period of time has control over the beast. So what is the beast? Uh, verse 7, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not 
and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and is yet uh, and yet is or is yet to come, will come in the future. It's a, a better way of uh, uh, looking at that phrase in the Greek. So there's four, uh, again, descriptions about the beast, and, uh, and some of this information will kind of build as we, uh, as we go along. And uh, I realize that uh, uh, if you just read, read chapter 17 on your own, <laughs> you'd be going, what are they talking about? In fact, you know, I, I kind of, <clears throat> you know, I... I do a lot of analyzing and diagramming before I, I ever get started, and I started drawing stick figures. <laughs> okay, I got eight kings here, I got ten horns on this one, just to try to track along to you know, make sure we're, you know, I'm getting what, they're, what John is saying. But uh, as we get into it, and you'll see that uh, there's a lot of speculation as to what this chapter means, but what we've seen is that there are hundreds of quotes of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. We've also seen that we're studying end times kingdoms, and we're not without other information. Daniel goes into great detail about the world empires, how they're going to come about. We'll read a few passages from Daniel 7. And when we look at what Daniel says and what John says, they go like this, and it makes perfectly good sense. And so that's what we're going to uh, attempt to do here this morning. But just, uh, again, basic facts, descriptions we've got about the beast. One is the beast is described with seven heads and ten horns, uh, which has the, been the description of, of the three beasts named so far. The Antichrist, Satan himself, and the false prophet, all described as beast, all described as having seven heads uh, and ten horns. Verse 9 gives us a little more explanation. It says, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. So we'll look at that more in verse 9, but uh, it tells us already that, again, the seven heads on the beast are, are, uh, are seven kingdoms or seven, uh, seven empires. The second thing about the beast is it is described as one who will ascend out of the demonic realm. It says the bottomless pit, and chapter 9 told us that the bottomless pit was open, plagues and locusts came out. Uh, the angel or the king of the bottomless pit was Satan himself, so this beast definitely, like the others, has a demonic uh, origin. Uh, back in chapter 13, it was the dragon or Satan who gave his power, his throne, and his great authority to this beast. So very much a demonic uh, origin. Uh, the third thing, the beast is described as one who will go to destruction. That's the word perdition. And uh, this beast will, in its final form, will be destroyed. And there's a couple of passages that, uh, that talk about that. Uh, and one is 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 8, and 9. Paul here, again, tipping my hand that I believe this is the Antichrist. Paul refers to him as the lawless one. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Antichrist will certainly be destroyed. He will go to perdition uh, in the end. Uh, later in Revelation 19, verse 20, when Jesus returns to planet Earth with you and I, uh, it says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, uh, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. They, again, the, the uh, false prophet as well as the Antichrist go to perdition as this beast does. So the woman, this false religious system, is sitting on and has some, therefore, control or a seem to be authority for a time over a beast that's going to be destroyed, and the Antichrist is going to perdition and going to be destroyed uh, as well. <clears throat> it gets a little more complicated, not less, so we're, we're just going to keep moving and try to bring this all back together in a moment. The fourth thing is the beast is described as one who will cause the earth dwellers to be amazed. Earth dwellers. Sounds like from a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? <laughs> and the earth dwellers. Yeah, but uh, uh, again, these are people that have rejected the grace of God. They've rejected the mercy of God. <clears throat> They've seen God do the miraculous. They've seen <clears throat> cataclysmic judgments come on the planet Earth. 
Uh, they've seen the two witnesses in Jerusalem be killed and be raised back to life. They've seen 144,000 uh, basically Jewish believers in Jesus as Messiah with a sign and a seal protected by God supernaturally going throughout the earth proclaiming the gospel. They've had an angel fly overhead speaking in every tongue and language and dialect known to man preaching the gospel. And they've had an angel warning them, do not take the mark of the beast. And despite all of this, they took the mark of the beast. They rejected the grace of God. They lived for earth and earth only and the pleasures of this life, which are going to be few during this time period. They are the earth dwellers. They are amazed at what is going on as well because most of them has bought into the woman, to the harlot, to a false religious system that seems to be setting on the beast or the last empire. And when it all changes, uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's quite startling and it's uh, amazing to them. The second thing is there's a <clears throat> duration of the world's kingdom is revealed, and that's in verses 9 to 13. There it says, here is a mind which calls for, for wisdom. So if you, uh, if you read through this, and don't really get it. This is not a condemnation to say that you don't have any wisdom. <clears throat> but it is a reminder. How do we understand this? With a mind that is called for wisdom. And I think what that means is, let the Bible speak for itself. In other words, I don't have to try to figure this out. It's already been explained to me by Daniel. I just need to review a little bit. How did Daniel say this thing would play off? John is certainly not going to contradict him. Uh, it's a, if we look at it in that sense, it'll make sense. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So let's go over this. First, we notice that the duration of the world kings is described as seven mountains. And... Um, but again, that's uh, identified for us uh, uh, right, right away. And there's, uh, I've heard uh, a lot of different views over this. And this is one of those chapters was I not only was drawing stick figures, trying to get this all straight in my own mind, <clears throat> then I'm, I'm reading like seven different people to, what does he think? What does he think? <laughs> I just want to make sure that I make sure that I kind of get this. And you get a lot of, a lot of variation. Some of them are uh, uh, interesting, uh, to say the least. Uh, the reformers, because it says seven mountains, and because they lived during a time when the, the Roman Catholicism ruled not only spiritually but politically and militarily within Western Europe and called all the shots, and if you didn't agree, you were persecuted uh, and so forth. So the reformers, uh, they looked at the Pope really as the Antichrist, uh, and they saw Rome as the city that is being spoken about uh, here. Rome has seven hills, there are seven mountains, it's speaking about Rome. I've heard a lot of guys that I respect, and it comes from the reformers, hold that view. Uh, the problem with, with that view is the text explains itself. Typically, uh, again, uh, a phrase like the mountain is a reference to a kingdom. We see it again in Daniel, uh, and we see it here. The next verse tells us that the seven mountains are seven kings. So that, that's, that's pretty obvious. When it started back in verse 1, it's going to be explained uh, in a moment as we get towards the end of the chapter. The woman, the false religious system, is sitting on, uh, on many waters. And the text says those are people, nations, tribes, and tongues. So it's, it's nations or kingdoms, and there's kings over them. So it's, it's not the city of Rome. Uh, there are those that say the seven kings then represent, they would hold to that, it's seven kings. But they would say that they are not kingdoms, but they are individual rulers. Uh, and they try to tie it into seven different Roman emperors. And they try to, but there, were, there were a lot of Roman emperors. So they try to pick out five that were persecuted Christians. Uh, and then they pick out Domitian, because there's five, right? 
then there's the one in John's day, and there's one still future. So they say it's individual rulers. It's five different Roman rulers, and that, that order and who they are changed. It's Domitian in John's day, and there's still one yet, yet future. Uh, but again, uh, that's, that's a tough view to, uh, uh, to hold because it contradicts Daniel. Daniel says there's seven world kingdoms. He says, and he names five in advance, uh, you know, as they click, as they click off. And um, so, again, the word king uh, in terms of the Old Testament, the New Testament prophecy is assumed there is a kingdom if there is a, a, a king. Notice verse 10. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have yet received no kingdom, king kingdoms. So what are the, what are the five kingdoms that Daniel mentioned? Well, we've been studying about two of them uh, in particular, or three, in our Wednesday night study in Isaiah. Uh, we've talked about how the Egyptian kingdom has fallen, and the Assyrians to the north in Isaiah's day are invading and taking over the, the ten tribes uh, in the north uh, of Israel. And they are threatening to come into and invade Jerusalem. And Isaiah is there encouraging his good friend, King Hezekiah, to not panic because God's going to protect the city uh, of Jerusalem. But then you have the later the Battle of Carchemish where basically the Babylonian Empire was at a very turning point, was able to conquer the Assyrians. So the Assyrians fall off the scene. So you've got the Egyptians, you've got the Assyrians. Now you have the Babylonians who eventually again come in and sack the city of Jerusalem on three different occasions. On the first time, they take Daniel, Meshach, and, uh, and the, other, uh, the other boys uh, off to Babylon. The second time they come in, they take uh, Ezekiel and many others. And the third time, they burn the city to the ground, the Babylonian Empire. And of course, Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're like the head of gold. Uh, and then he goes right on down, naming the kingdoms. The next one that Daniel said would come about would be the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the last one would be the Greek Empire that Daniel said would be split into fourths, which it was through his four, four generals. So Daniel names the five kingdoms. Again, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon and uh, Greece and um, Medo-Persian. Thank you very much. Medo-Persian Empire uh, and then the, uh, the Greek uh, Empire itself. So here, John is revealing that there's been five kingdoms in the past. Those are the five and there's one in his day, the Roman Empire. And there's still one yet to come, which Daniel says will be a revived Roman Empire. And that's exactly what, uh, what John is talking about here. There are five that have already been. There's one that is right now. And there's still one that is, uh, that is yet to come uh, again. Uh, and the question for us might be that the duration uh, under 2D of the future kingdom would be limited, this future kingdom, the revived Roman Empire, uh, because it hasn't come. Five have fallen, one is and their other has not yet come. And uh, <clears throat> so everybody's with me so far? Somebody said, could you have pictures of all those? <laughs> uh, yeah, you didn't want to see my drawings. But uh, I made pictures for me just to get to, uh, to this point. Uh, one other thing just to point out in verse 10. When it says five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come in the Greek. It's, John could have used two, one of two words. One means one, another of a different kind, but he doesn't. He uses one of the same kind. So you've got those kingdoms. Roman is his day, and another of the same kind is coming still yet, uh, yet future. Uh, and one of the questions we could ask ourselves is, how close are we to this time, this time of the revived Roman Empire? And, and we've been over this before, but just to go over a couple of slides uh, with you, uh, just in a sense of review, if we're uh, on the right page, we can go to the next slide. So again, uh, end time global government is going to arise. It's going to be a revived Roman Empire. Ten regions described uh, and so forth. We've talked about that because, again, that's the ten kings. So we go to the five, Rome, revived Roman Empire. Within the revived Roman Empire, there are ten regions and ten zones. Since the early 1990s, 
That's our, the, the planet has already been divided up. Uh, and, uh, and every time world leaders from that time on have discussed these 10 regions of the world, if we could control them as economic zones and we could control them militarily, then we could have peace on planet Earth is their, is their thinking. How long have these guys been around? In 1948, a group known as the Club of Rome signed the Treaty of Rome, creating the basis for what we now call the European Union or the EU. The Pope at that time referred to it as the revived Roman Empire. Not my words, one of the world leaders uh, at, at that time. So those are the 10 kings. There's a, a, another kingdom coming, but it's going to have 10 rulers. And it's out of that that the Antichrist is going to rise. Let's talk about the EU for just a moment and go on to the next slide. We've got their, uh, uh, the stamp that was created on their behalf when the European Union was, uh, uh, first came about. And uh, funny thing, there's a woman on a beast there. I don't know if anyone else noticed that on that, uh, on that stamp. Uh, there's some other things about the European Union that are very interesting that, again, in light of the mystery Babylon religion that has infiltrated world religions and actually come right into Christianity and spread to uh, some great extent and some aspects of Christianity, uh, others of us just get Christmas trees and dye eggs and stuff. We're not really sure what that's all about. But again, that all goes all the way back to mystery Babylon. But um, it's part of the European Union. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, that, that means, if you, if you have a Roman Catholic background and you see those colors and those stars, it might mean something to you. It did to me simply because um, uh, when I still designed and built stained glass window, the Roman Catholic Church was one of my best customers. And I would have to incorporate and read and study about their symbolism that needed to be incorporated in, uh, in, certain, in certain windows. And this is one of the symbolisms of Mary. Mary is the queen of heaven, and those are her colors, and the Roman Catholic Church see her as the woman in Revelation 12. Remember Revelation 12? There's a symbolism there of a woman with 12 stars over her. She's about ready to give birth to the Messiah. Satan, pictured as a dragon, is there wanting to pounce on and destroy and kill the Messiah as he comes. Roman Catholic Church sees that as the Virgin Mary. Of course, we studied it. We saw her representing the nation of Israel and those 12 stars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But through Roman Catholicism, they see it as the 12 stars represent Mary. So here, here we have the European Union, uh, their stamp and some of their other literature and materials printed right on the front very proudly. They're the woman who rides a beast right out of Revelation. And again, Mystery Babylon finds itself, because that's at the core, again, this worship of the Queen of Heaven comes right out of Mystery Babylon. We find it on the flag of the European Union. Let's, uh, and, and so I'm not, I'm not speculating. Uh, again, it's Leon Mar uh, Marshall, who is a former Secretary General, Council of Europe, affirmed that the stars are those of the woman of the ap apocalypse. apocalypse. So it's, it's right, they know it's from the book of Revelation which they don't see it as an inspired word of God. They find it an interesting thing, full of mythology and, and so forth, but uh, interesting to them. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, the European Union headquarters, and we've showed this to you before in, uh, in Brussels. Um, in, in Strasbourg, France, the rival parliamentary building, uh, one, again, with the Tower of Babel, features a mural of a woman riding the beast. The new Brussels headquarters, this one, for the Council of Europe contains a bronze statue of a woman riding, uh, riding the beast and then upon the many waters, <laughs> matching what we've got here. Now, lest you think that this only kind of looks like a Tower of Babel, let's, let's go on to a couple, the next slide. Now, this is just uh, simply a, a painting, you know, to kind of give you an idea of what maybe an ancient ziggurat or, or, or a tower looked like. Uh, and you can see that that looks very similar to their headquarters. And we can go on to the next slide, which now is one of their uh, European Union posters. Just so we're not speculating, Europe, many tongues, one voice, the Tower of Babel. So again, there's going to be a world religious system. 
uh, in the end that will sweep through and be able to be practiced and take over in the first half of the tribulation. The Jews are going to be able to rebuild the temple. They're going to be practicing their faith. Temple sacrifices will be going on. There is some limited degree of, quote, religious freedom under the guise of this world religious system and some aspect of Judaism uh, within Jerusalem. And the European Union, which we think, whether it's called that in the end or not, right now it's just Europe, but in the end it's going to be worldwide. It's going to make up of 10, 10 zones around the world, and there'll be 10 leaders over them. One of those leaders becomes the Antichrist. But that's what's going on in the first half of the tribulation. I'm not sure if that's the last one or not. What's the next slide? Did that one already. So uh, let's go back to our, our text. Notice verse uh, 11. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So again, uh, just to, the beast is this revived Roman Empire. Uh, and it's got ten kings over it, running it, calling the shots, peace and safety. It's going to be a great thing, greatest thing since sliced bread. Going to bring peace to the Middle East. Going to be a wonderful thing. Going to solve the monetary crisis, uh, all the economic woes of the world and so forth. In poverty, it's just going to be a wonderful thing uh, as it comes. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to have the ten rulers or the ten kings uh, over it. That is the seventh empire, right? We go back to uh, Egypt, Assyria, Medo-Persian, Greece, the first five. <laughs> I'm looking at Emily, am I getting all five? <laughs> I knew I should have had pictures up there. Uh, and then the Roman Empire that was during John's day, number six. The seventh empire is the revived Roman Empire. It has 10 kings over it. The beast that was, that is not, is himself also the eighth. So the eighth ends up being the Antichrist. He's one of those 10 kings, and out of that, he's going to completely take over. He becomes the eighth king in the eighth kingdom. And uh, a couple of verses uh, uh, about that. Um, Revive Roman Empire, again, uh, comes in the future. Uh, John says it's just for a short time. He says for one hour. Daniel tells us it's just for the first half of the tribu tribulation period. Uh, and in Daniel 7, he describes the coming kingdoms uh, as, as horns and, and tells us uh, in verse 24, chapter 7, the ten horns are ten kings, so it's not speculation. Uh, a couple of verses. Verse 8 from uh, Daniel 7, he says, I was considering the horns, the kings, and there was another horn, a king, a little king, a little one, coming up from among them, he's part of these ten, before whom three of the first kings, horns, were plucked out by the roots. They were removed violently. And then in this horn, this king, eyes were like the eyes of a man in a mouth speaking pompous words. The little horn, the little king, is the Antichrist. He's part of the ten. He's part of that seventh kingdom. He's going to become the eighth and establish his own in the last half of the tribulation. He starts out little, but he then begins to take control Three of them, he plucks them out violently, and apparently the others then just choose to submit to him. Later in verse 24, Daniel says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change uh, times and law. Then the saints will be given into his hand for a times, times, and a half time, three and a half years. In the middle of the tribulation, remember the Antichrist takes over. He sets himself up in the temple, an image of himself in the newly rebuilt Jewish temple, and does what Jesus says that Daniel spoke about, sets up the abomination that causes desolation, an image it's energized by Satan. It comes to life, and he declares himself to be God, gets rid of the Babylonian, you know, mystery Babylon, 
uh, world religious system and now declares himself to be worshipped. And again, you have a, a holocaust against the people of God that, uh, uh, that ensues. So the ten horns are ten kings of the revived Roman Empire. They have received no kingdom yet. They will receive authority for one hour, a short time. They will be kings with the beast or the Antichrist. They will be of one mind. And in the end, they will give their power and their authority to the beast or to the Antichrist. How are we doing so far? Let's continue. Verse 14, there's a downfall of those ten kings will be a war with the Lamb. Uh, these will make war with the Lamb. The Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So again, uh, it'll be their downfall. How will they meet their downfall? Well, it's because they decide to come against the Lord. Uh, these, these kings that have submitted themselves now to the Antichrist in the end, at the end of the tribulation period, will basically gather in Israel in the plains of Megiddo, and they will basically be there for one last holocaust against the Jewish people. And at that point, Jesus Christ returns. He is returning because the remnant of Jews down there in, in Basra, if you haven't been here for the rest of these studies, I just pity you right now. But uh, we'll, uh, I actually do have a graph of this, and we'll go through it uh, at, at, uh, when we get to chapter 19. That remnant of Jews, again, cry out. They cry out to accept Jesus as their Messiah. That's what J brings Jesus back to planet Earth. They will look upon the one they have pierced. They will mourn for one as one mourns for an only child. And God will pour out on them a spirit of grace and supplication. Remember, Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives and looked over at the Jewish people in Jerusalem and said, you will not see me again until you say I'm the Messiah. You won't see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will, and he will come. And when he comes, part of the campaign of Armageddon is to wipe out these ten kings. And that's what uh, verse 14 is making reference to. They are destroyed because Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Now, uh, Psalms 2 uh, goes into this in some detail. We've mentioned that on a few occasions. But there it says, Why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah or anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And of course it goes on and says, and the Lord laughs or scoffs at heaven to think that they could turn against him and destroy them. But they're destroyed uh, and they are destroyed because Jesus is the the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The second thing about the downfall is those coming uh, with the Lamb will see it and notice that uh, that's us. Uh, they are called chosen and faithful, which is uh, uh, which is an awesome thing. The Lord does everything for us. I mean, we would say He is faithful. I don't think any of you would say that we are faithful. But when God looks at us and you and I. Uh, he calls, he says, I'm the one that called you. I'm the one that drew you to myself. And I see you as being, as being faithful. Uh, and in the end, uh, that's what the Bible says about us. You know, he is faithful to complete the work that he's begun uh, in us. Uh, in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus says, uh, trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. Or I like the mansions thing better. Are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. And I will, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be with me also. Jesus will come for us in the rapture of the church and will be with him in heaven during the tribulation. And when he returns to planet earth, Revelation 19, at the end of the tribulation, we will still be with him. He comes to get us so that we'll be with him in heaven during the tribulation and when he returns. And that's what this is a reference to. And uh, he refers to us as those that are, that are chosen and those that are faithful. The last thing is the last 10 kings will be destroyed by the false religious system. It's, uh, excuse me, the last kings will destroy the false religious system. We've kind of, uh, at this point, the text has ignored where it began with 
with, uh, again, the woman or the harlot that for a period of time in the first three and a half years have actually sat on or had some degree of control over the revived Roman Empire with its ten kings, one of which is the Antichrist, who's going to eventually take over and establish his own kingdom. He becomes the eighth king or the eighth kingdom. But for a while, this false religious system is sitting on it. That all changes at some point in time. Verse 15, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast, to the Antichrist until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So a couple things here on this last point. The ten kings will, will destroy the last uh, world religious system. So uh, apparently, you know, they, <laughs> they put up with it and uh, it would not be the first time that somebody politically used religion as a ruse to set people up and get what they wanted out of them, and that's apparently what's going on. They really hold the power. They hold all the control. They control things economically. They control things mil militarily. Apparently, she is growing rich, and they are growing rich, uh, rich with her, and they allow that to continue for three and a half years. But in the uh, middle, as God puts it in their heart, is the Antichrist is going to basically claim to be God himself and demand to be worshipped, God puts it in their hearts to destroy this world religious system uh, at that point in time. So they destroy the woman referred to here as a, uh, as a harlot. Now, again, it's uh, interesting that, secondly, the destruction uh, is described to us. They will make her desolate and naked. Now, she starts out being described as, as noble. She's dressed in scarlet. She's got fine linen. She's beautiful in adornment. She's got gold and jewels and riches, speaking of her wealth. And apparently all of that is going to be, uh, be taken away. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So again, very a graphic description of the destruction of this world religious system in the end and the complete control of the 10 kings so that out of them, the little horn, the little king, all of a sudden will He'll take out three of them, cause the others to subdue. So now he, he's got everything. No more world religious system, no uh, revived Roman Empire. It's just the Antichrist, and he's calling all the shots. That's what it's like during the last three and a half years. And remember, the timing of all of that is Satan has made his last frontal assault in heaven, and he's been driven out of heaven by Michael the archangel, and that also kicks off the last three and a half years. The dragon falls, Satan, he is furious, and he unleashes then these events of completely taking over through the Antichrist, trying to do, do the best he can to, to persecute and kill every believer on the planet, as well as to annihilate the Jewish people, because he knows the end of the story. If they repent and they cry out to Jesus as Messiah, he's coming back for them, and it's all over. If he can kill them all, he can prevent that. He's tried many times in history, hasn't he? That's why there's so much persecution against the Jewish people and so much anti-Semitism uh, in, in the world today. It's growing and apparently it's going to, uh, to get worse. So this religious system is destroyed in the end with quite, quite graphic uh, terminology. Foresee that destruction will take place according to the word of God. Verse 17, for God put it in their hearts to fulfill his, his purpose. And, uh, and he is the one that is behind all of this uh, and uh, orchestrating all the events. And, uh, and then lastly, the destruction is of a woman who is the city. Very interesting. Verse 18 will lead us into the next chapter. Keep in mind, there are no chapter breaks in the original manuscript. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth and it is another one of those times when John uses a definite article. We'd say in English, a definite article, noun, definite article, adjective. It's the city, the great. Uh, if you want to find out what that means, you've got to come back next week. 
But uh, let me just say a couple of things about it, because that's where chapter 18 goes. It's uh, fallen, fallen is the city, uh, is Babylon the great. Uh, there are people that, uh, that look at this, and this, this phrase, the city the great, is used uh, on about 10 occasions in the book of Revelation. The first one is used of Jerusalem. So some people say, so the city is Jerusalem. That's the city that's falling. That's what's being described <coughs> in chapter 18. Uh, of course, then you get chapter 21 of the, the, new ha the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. It's referred also to as the city of the great. So, okay, that doesn't really work. <laughs> work. Uh, and then the ones in the middle are all referenced to, uh, to Babylon. So some people hold that, uh, that Babylon, the city of the great, is the actual uh, city of Babylon, that it will get rebuilt. And... Uh, Joel Rosenberg, there's a few others, kind of paint this scenario given the uh, context of, of current events. Uh, the fact that, um, that this could never happen as long as Saddam Hussein controlled Iraq, but he no longer does. Uh, they are uh, now a democracy uh, and, an, and an ally uh, because of uh, brave men and women that went from our country and went over there and, and gave them freedom. Uh, and what will happen, according to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, here in the near future, Ezekiel predicted that one day, never happened before in the history uh, of the planet, but one day the Persians, Iran, Ahmadinejad, and Magog, or again Russia to the north, Putin in particular, who still runs the country, they would form an alliance together, and they have done that. They will also incorporate other Islamic nations, Ezekiel said, and they will make a move against Jerusalem to take it over. And when they do, God will intervene and destroy them, basically. And out of the ashes of the Middle East, there's only going to be a few, a few places that are still pumping oil, which goes for a, a few more bucks than it does today. One of those places will be Iraq, because they're not involved in, in any of that. Uh, they are neutral. And they're, they're left out of that. That would have been hard to picture until, until recent times. Would have been hard to picture how Saddam Hussein would not be in on the attack of Israel. He was the guy calling for it all along. But he's no longer on the scene. That country has changed dramatically. And that's only happened very, very recently. So all of this is uh, all kind of shaping up and, uh, and taking place. Uh, and so what is the woman? Well, some people say it is Babylon. It's going to get rebuilt, and they're going to be rich, and they're going to be wealthy because of what happens in terms of what we call the Magogian uh, invasion. Now, I think uh, given the fact of the testings of, of missiles, the rhetoric, and all that's going on in the Middle East today, some would say that's going to happen pretty soon. And I've uh, suggested that we call our tour to Israel the Ezekiel 38 tour because we, we could be there in time to see uh, Russia and Iran invade, try to invade, uh, and then God supernaturally, pr with fire coming down from heaven and brimstone, protecting the nation of Israel. And you don't even have to pay extra for that if you're there. <laughs> be like seeing Moses part the Red Sea. I mean, it'd just be awesome. Think of the stories you come back to tell. Oh, it was awesome, man. This fire was coming down. It was like a bubble over as God protected us. We're on the rooftops worshiping. It was unreal. No, it, uh, anyway, it's uh, coming... <clears throat> coming to um, a planet near you yeah, in, the, uh, in the immediate future. But uh, who is the woman? Is it, uh, is it an actual city? Is it Jerusalem? I doubt it. Some people say it's the city of Rome, that it becomes the, the center of this world religion, and it all centers out of there. Again, that was the position of a lot of the reformers. Some people believe it's an actual city itself, and, uh, and some hold the view that uh, it's not a city, it's just symbolic of this world religious system. And what we read in chapter 18 is actually a declaration and details of what we've just discussed. Which is it? Well, you're going to have to come back next week to find out. But uh, <clears throat> I wanted to close with the, uh, a quote from, uh, from Charles Spurgeon. Uh, it's it's hard enough just to go through the information and explain it <laughs> when we get to stuff like this, much less than what you, I would want to do is bring some kind of application for it. Well, we are seen in the text. We are called uh, chosen uh, and, and faithful, and, uh, uh, and it all speaks of God's grace and what he's done for us, and, 
And there's certainly things that we want to take away from the book of Revelation, and one of them is to have an eternal perspective. Anyway, I came across this uh, uh, at Spurgeon's uh, morning and evening, uh, you know, great, great devotion. But this was January 29th, read it uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and he says this, In our Christian pilgrimage, it is well, for the most part, to be looking forward. Forward lies the crown, and onward is the goal. Whether it be for hope, for joy, or for consolation, or for the inspiring of our love, the future must be, after all, be the grand object of the eye of faith. Looking into the future, we see sin cast out, the body of sin and death destroyed, the soul made perfect and fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Looking further yet, the believer's enlightened eye can see death's river past, the gloomy stream forged, and the hills a light attained on which standeth the celestial city. He seeth himself enter within the pearly gates, hailed as more than a conqueror, crowned by the hand of Christ, embraced in the arms of Jesus, glorified with him, and made to sit together with him on his throne, even as he is overcome and set down with the Father on his throne. The thought of this future may well relieve the darkness of the past and the gloom of the present. The joys of heaven will surely compensate for the sorrows of earth. Hush, hush, my doubts. Death is but a narrow stream, and thou shalt soon have forged it. Time, how short. Eternity, how long. Death, how brief. Immortality, how endless. The road is so, so short, and I shall soon be there. I would you like to hear a sermon about that guy. No wonder they called him the Prince of Preachers. But uh, yeah, again, just spells out so beautifully what should be our object in our eyes. Some people say that uh, uh, if, you're, if you're too heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I want to suggest the opposite is true. Unless you're heavenly minded, you will be of no earthly good. Because we've got to keep our eyes on the prize. And, uh, and keep your eye on the ball. Because there's a lot of distractions that are out there, but it's... It's all going to wind up and wrap up pretty, pretty quick once it starts, uh, starts coming down.